Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello there, this is Dee, and welcome to episode 62 of the Benzo Free Podcast. We have a full plate of stuff to cover in our episode today, so I'll try and keep the introduction short. Still, I did want to check in with you briefly before I got too far. I don't want to talk too much about the virus today for a couple of reasons. One, we dedicated almost our entire episode last time to dealing with the anxiety in and around the virus. And two, we all need some distraction. And it's hard enough to escape it in the news, let alone in your Benzo podcast. Let me just say this quick thing, though. One really positive trend I've seen in some of you who I've been corresponding with these past few weeks, especially those of you who have finished your taper and are on the recovering side of withdrawal, is that you have found a different perspective towards this current crisis. I'll I'll talk a bit more about perspective in our feature today, but I've noticed this in myself lately too. In fact, with all this going on, in my marriage right now, I've been the calm one (laughs) these past few weeks. Who would have seen that coming? Not me, that's for sure. You see, those of us who have survived benzo withdrawal, we have seen some of this before. The isolation, the fear, the instability the questions, the unending questions. For many of us, we've been through worse times. And that insight provides us a slightly different perspective, a a healthier perspective, and even, I dare say, a slightly more positive outlook. It's it's so bizarre to be the calm one (laughs) in my household for once, but I'm not complaining. I guess my anxiety has improved more than I thought, and now it's time to comfort and help out the others in my family. But enough of the virus. Let me just say this. I hope everyone is keeping safe, keeping your distance, and finding creative ways to weather this storm. We will get through this together. My thoughts and prayers are with all of you. Now, back to the podcast and finding a way to distract ourselves a bit. Yes, some of the content of today's podcast will be serious, such as our Benzo story and parts of our feature. It kind of goes along with the territory of our subject matter, but I hope to balance this out with some positivity today and a little bit of humor now and then. (laughs) At times like these, we all need some levity, and I'm going to attempt to do my part. Attempt being the key word, I want to remember that. (laughs) But please know that my levity is just that, an attempt to lift spirits, and not in any way diminishing the seriousness of what's happening in the world today, or equally of the difficulties so many of you are dealing with in your withdrawal. I just wanted to make that clear. That being said, let's take a look at our format. Today, we are going to have our introduction, spotlight, Benzo story feature, and our moment of peace. Today's feature is Seven Little Known Symptoms of Benzo Withdrawal. We'll look at the lesser talked about effects of these drugs, including physical, psychological, and even lifestyle ones. I hope you like it. And before we move on, don't forget we need your help. We need feedback of any kind. I truly want to hear from you. You can provide feedback in four ways. Comment directly on one of our podcasts or blog posts so others can see. Fill out our feedback form at benzofree.org feedback. 
email us at podcast at benzofree.org or leave feedback on one of our podcast carriers so others can find us. While you're on the website, don't forget to sign up for our mailing list at benzofree.org slash subscribe. And if you wish to help support what we do here, you can visit our donations page at benzofree.org slash donate. Trust me, every little bit helps. And don't forget, the Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. Now, let's shine our spotlight on something new. In our spotlight section today, we have another announcement from Benzo Free. Yes, last time we had this section, it was also something from Benzo Free. It was our artist corner on the website that I was announcing, but Please don't think that this section is only for items from Benzo Free. That is not its intent. The spotlight section of the podcast is for any event or item of interest in the Benzo community. And the best way for me to have different things to talk about is for you to send them to me. Whether it's an event, a new organization or site, legislative progress, a new film, or anything focused on benzodiazepines or Z drugs or the effects of dependence and withdrawal. I'd love to hear from you, but back to what we're talking about today. I mentioned in the last episode of the podcast that one of the reasons I was slowing down the pace of the podcast was to split the content of Benzo Free into two sections. Into the podcast, focused more on benzodiazepines, dependence, and withdrawal, along with the website. And then a new YouTube channel focused more on anxiety, general anxiety issues, whether or not related to benzos. If you want to learn more about the reasonings behind this change, please go back and listen to the last episode of the podcast. <laughs> I don't think anyone wants me to rehash all that here again. <laughs> but if you are curious as to why these things are happening, that's the best place to go. Now it's a couple of weeks later, and the new YouTube channel is finally live and ready to go. Drum roll, please! Oh, that's right. I'm the drummer. <laughs> okay, screw it. I, I'm not going to do a drum roll. It, it, the channel is called Easing Anxiety. There, that's the name of it. For now, the easiest way to find it is via the link in our show notes and on the website. We don't have a YouTube URL yet. We need a few more subscribers until we can get that set up. You can also find us sometimes by searching in YouTube for the keywords easing anxiety. But since we are new with very few views, it might be pretty far down the list of search results. But if you do check it out and you're interested in the content it provides, please, I'm asking one favor, and that is to subscribe to the channel and click on the notifications icon so you will know when new videos are available. Unlike the podcast, I don't have to send out an email every time new content is loaded. YouTube will do that for me. Yay to YouTube. <laughs> and you know, while you're there, leave a comment if you like. The more people who check out the channel, watch a video or two, subscribe, and even comment, the more our channel gets recognized in searches, leading to more viewers which then leads to possible monetization. You get where I'm going with this, don't you? Which then leads to funding for both the channel and Benzo Free. I realize we have a long way to go before this channel garners enough subscribers and views to lead to any type of monetization, but we have to start somewhere. Whew, that was a bit long-winded. <laughs> Sorry about that. There are currently two videos on the channel right now, with another coming Wednesday or Thursday. And they are in three different formats, actually. The first one, titled Welcome to Easing Anxiety, is our welcome video, and it explains a bit about the new YouTube channel, a bit about me, a, a bit about benzos, and a, a bit about other stuff. The second video I posted was titled Five Minute Relaxation Video at Crater Lake. And it is similar to our moment of peace, just a brief meditation video to help people relax. And the third video coming in the next day or so will be my first vlog. And yes, this is the first time when you get to see me talk on screen. Well, except for the W Bad event last year. 
please don't be frightened or feel you have to adjust your set. This is actually how I look. Red hair, red beard, freckles. I got the whole ginger thing going on in spades. Yes, my Celtic slash Scandinavian roots are quite apparent when you look at me. But <laughs> I digress. Our, our third video will be about easing anxiety amid COVID-19. And we'll cover some similar territory as our previous podcast episode on the topic, but with a few variations and some new stuff stuck in here and there. And that's just the very beginning. Now, like I said on the podcast last week, these videos are a bit rough in the beginning. <laughs> Just like with the podcast, it will take some time for me to relearn the craft of video production and editing and to find out what works and what doesn't, which means, yes, you saw this coming. I need feedback now more than ever. Please comment on the video or provide feedback via BenzoFree as usual and let me know what you think, what you'd like to see, and where you'd like to see this channel heading. I really need your feedback to help mold this channel into something that provides support for people who suffer with chronic anxiety. I am counting on you as my friends to help us mold this YouTube channel just as you did the podcast. Well, that's it for now. As I said, the podcast will continue with scheduled releases twice a month and the YouTube channel will be its sister production, relying on each other for support as needed. Thanks for listening to me ramble about my new stuff and let's move on to the Benzo story. Our story today is from Kurt. Now, just so you know, Kurt is not his real name. In fact, I changed all the names in the story by request and even remove some other identifying information to protect anonymity. Sharing your story anonymously is always an option for anyone who wants to share, so please keep that in mind. And I also need to put a trigger warning on this one. This is a hard story to hear. Kurt was polydrugged over many years, dealt with serious mental health issues, including suicidality. If these types of stories are a trigger for you at all, especially with all the other stressors in the world right now, then it is probably a good idea to skip over this one. Remember that there is a time index at the top of our show notes to help you find the next section. Kurt's story is also a longer one, but it's one I really wanted to share. It involves multiple psychiatric drugs over many years. When I hear struggles such as this, I realize how lucky I was with my experience. And I remind myself, if Kurt can keep going, then I can keep going. I'm hoping others will find similar motivation in his words. Kurt writes, I, like many others, simply went to a doctor in 1994 when I was having problems with anxiety and depression. It runs really deep in our family on my mom's side. I actually tried counseling for months before starting the medications, but a counselor told me that nothing could be done for me and that I needed to see a psychiatrist and get a prescription. I was an idiot, so I listened. On day one, the psychiatrist put me on Xanax and Prozac, the fun drugs of the time. I saw him for years and years, and I was on numerous drug cocktails for all of that time, but... My foundation was always the heavy use of benzos and Prozac. Actually, just a couple of years into the game, I had to see a different psychiatrist due to a health insurance network change, and she switched me over to Clonopin. I was never on less than 3 milligrams a day in the beginning. I eventually got back to my original psychiatrist, Doc, and he kept going with a load of meds on top of the Clonopin and Prozac. Needless to say, I was a mess. I was stoned out of my mind for all those years and somehow faked my way through life. We were in Kentucky at the time. Michelle and I have been married 29 years. And at last count, I think I've had 24 jobs during those 29 years. Most of them I can't even remember, but 
I managed to BS my way into all those positions, and some were actually really good. Of course, I couldn't handle them, so I always ran to the next one. I always did really well at the beginning, but then the anxiety and depression kicked into overdrive as the pressures mounted, so I would quit. Wonder what happened? Wonder why I felt like pure grade-A trash all the time? Found no answers, and then moved on to the next job. I was living the dream, more like a nightmare, as you well know. Little did I know that it was the drugs that were keeping me out of a career and jobs. At one point, we had another health insurance change, so I had to see another psychiatrist for a good chunk of time. This is no lie, but she increased my dose to 8 milligrams a day of clonopin, increased the Prozac, and then also put me on lithium, Depakote, Ativan, why not add another benzo to the mix, right? And, oh yes, Vyvanse for my attention deficit. Like a complete fool, I listened to her and trusted her. I mean, she knew what she was doing, right? I was convinced by her and many others that I was a complete mess and needed all these meds to fix my brain. It's no surprise that I ended up in a mental health hospital. Mental health hospital, I, I think not. It was a shame and a complete mess seriously sad. I felt really horrible for all those innocent people that were there. Anyway, I came really close on two occasions over the years to ending my life by taking a boatload of stockpiled clonopin along with a seriously hefty amount of wild turkey. I think I didn't go through with it because I was actually afraid that it wouldn't work. How's that for sick? I drove far away from our house and stared at the drugs and wild turkey for hours, but a God thing must have happened because I didn't do it either time. What a ride that was. At one point, I was so anxious, turns out it was tolerance, but I didn't know it, and I began running miles and miles just to relieve the misery. That escalated to full-blown marathon races around the country and then ultra-marathon running. I made Forrest Gump look like a sloth. It really was truly amazing even to me. Somewhere in the middle of all this, I managed to fake my way through a master's degree, too, in wellness. Yep, I got a master's degree in exercise and wellness when I was actually a really sick and suicidal guy. Not a great quality master's program, I must admit. I was actually so good at faking it that I really should have been given a PhD in faking it by now. Next, somewhere around 2010, my psychiatrist told me that I was broken and couldn't be fixed. With one exception. He said I needed ECT. I wasn't familiar with brain zapping at the time, but hey, these people know what they're doing, right? First do no harm. Got it. He even referred me to a super-duper psychiatrist who specializes in extreme mental health cases up in Cincinnati, Ohio. We drove up there. He looked at my records and said, Yep, your last hope is electroconvulsive therapy. We figured that this whoop de doo shrink must know what he's doing. So off to Louisville, Kentucky, we went for the zapping. I was beyond suicidal, so I figured it couldn't hurt. It was a mess, not to mention embarrassing, and oh yeah, I was starting yet another job the following week. After six treatments, I just felt like it was really all wrong. I just couldn't do it anymore. I missed being normal, and had almost resigned myself to the thought that normal was just some setting on a washing machine or something. Anyway, so eventually Michelle and I left Kentucky and moved to South Carolina. Long story, but we felt like the move would really help me with my situation. But it got worse. I was ultra-suicidal, and then Michelle got diagnosed with advanced-stage breast cancer. 
Also, I had surgery on my back before we left Kentucky, so running was now out of my life. It's what I had counted on for years for me to survive and cope. Michelle got through her messy ordeal like a true winner. I had another surgery on my back and had a little bit of hope. You see, I, for some reason, had slowly taken myself off all meds except Clonopin and Prozac. I, I think I just got tired of the game. Doctor's visits, co-pays, shame, and swallowing loads of pills every day. I eventually got off the Prozac, but what a ride that was. Before that, people and docs kept telling me that there was no way I could be depressed because I was on an antidepressant. I then started to try and cut from 6 milligrams a day of clonopin to 5 and 3 quarters. I had been on this for 21 years and at high doses, so I was extremely sensitive to any cut. It went over like a lead balloon. I thought I was going to lose my mind with that experience. I kept trying and eventually hit the internet to see what I could learn. I had no idea about the horrors of benzos until then. And I almost went running for the cliff. I thought there was no way I could possibly survive all that I had already been through, plus tapering off of six plus milligrams a day of clonopin. I was horrified at what I learned. I, I guess you could say that now the real ultra marathon had started. I then found Benzo Buddies, made some great friends who I still stay in touch with weekly via phone and or email today, and learned about the daily liquid micro-tapering method. I searched and researched long and hard and felt like it was the way to go for me. I actually tried to learn about crossing over to Valium for the longer half-life, but I drove around for weeks and weeks looking for a doctor that would work with me, but no such luck. So, I started the process of converting the clonopin to liquid and tapering. I've been tapering for over four and a half years now and still have quite a ways to go. I was already by nature super sensitive to light, sound, touch, etc. But years and years of being on the drug of the month club made me even more sensitive. Highly sensitive. I have felt every single cut no matter how small. Life stressors have made the journey even crazier, but things have gotten a bit better considering the circumstances. You've got to have faith somewhere along the line, or the finish line will continue to get pushed further and further out. I know without a doubt that I could kick this awful drug quicker if given the real opportunity to do so. But I've had no choice but to work a job during these years, and I had to move to full-time in order to help with financial challenges. I moved my newest full-time job about five months ago, and the ride has been plain miserable, but I'm doing it, baby. It's a big daily challenge for me to get through a day of work, considering my back pain, claustrophobia, and traffic going on right outside the door and window where I sit. Like so many others, I've gone to multiple doctors and specialists after having severe withdrawal side effects that push me to the limit of medical and physical concern. MRIs, colonoscopies, ultrasounds, and lots of poking and prodding have thankfully led to nothing to this point. These days, I just let everything roll on without going down the rabbit hole of doctors. But I can listen to my body pretty well run things by my friends, and kind of make a decision based on gut feelings. Again, I just got tired of doc appointments, co-pays, waiting for test results, missing time at work, yada, yada, yada. Thank God I've got Michelle. Wow. What a rock she is. I'm over 25 and a half years now as far as pumping clonopin through my system, including four and a half years of my taper and counting. A finish line is sitting stationary somewhere out there waiting for me to cross it. Talk about tapering slowly. <laughs> I'm the poster child for that, but I've had no choice. Hopefully, everyone else on this journey can squint their eyes and see or find their finish line. If not, 
then squint a little harder and take another step closer to it. It's there. You'll all get there. Little by little, a little becomes a lot. That's it. Keep doing what you're doing by offering hope. And let me know if you're ever near our area. No theme parks here, but it's still a fun visit. Take care, Kurt. P.S. I miss beer. <laughs> oh, that was a heck of a story to, to read, and I'm sure a heck of a one to hear. Thank you, Kurt. Wow, what an odyssey you have been through. Oh, and, and I missed beer too, <laughs> but don't worry. It will be there waiting for you when you are through. Kurt's story may be hard to listen to, but like I said at the beginning, it's one that needed to be shared. Sometimes these stories, even the ones hard to hear, connect with us. We see somebody going through what we've gone through. We see somebody going through something worse than we've gone through and yet recovering. Even the hard stories to hear can be helpful to some people. Even though Kurt went through such trials for so long, he still has the ability to find humor along the way and found a wonderful way to interject it into the narrative of his story. I know you still have a ways to go, Kurt, but you've come so far. And I know you're going to make it and find a new, amazing life on the other side. Please, take care, my friend, and keep in touch. And we still need stories. In fact, I'm not even sure if I have one in the queue for next episode. So if you've been thinking of sending one to me, now would be a great time. Just go to the feedback form and submit them. And don't forget to click the permissions button so I can share it on the podcast. And now, without further ado, on to our feature. Our feature today is Seven Little Known Symptoms of Benzo Withdrawal. As you may remember, well, that is if you've been listening for longer than a few months to the podcast, we did a 14-part series on the symptoms of benzo withdrawal. Each episode was focused on one particular category of symptoms. Seven of them were physical and seven of them were psychological. We even revisited some of them like our Take Two episode on benzo belly a few weeks ago. But there's another group of symptoms that don't always fit into the standard classifications, or if they do, we just don't spend a lot of time on them. Sometimes because they are more infrequent, but even more so, in my opinion, because we don't think about them or perhaps even notice them and attribute them to our condition. Well, today we're going to pay some much needed attention to the redheaded stepchildren, yes, as a redhead, I get to say that, <laughs> of the benzo symptomology spectrum. Some of these are physical symptoms, some of these are psychological symptoms, and some are more lifestyle changes that happen from the experience. Please remember, and I say this with emphasis, you, you can hear the emphasis, can't you? Please remember <laughs> that these are only possible symptoms and effects, and that no one gets all of these, or even most of these, or sometimes even any of these. I know I say it a lot, but I feel I have to. Some people recover from benzodependence after long-term use with few, if any, problems, and they are in the majority. Those of us with difficult withdrawal are the minority. And those of us in protracted withdrawal or with severe withdrawal complications are in the even smaller minority around 10 to 15%. So please don't look at this like some hypochondriac's automat where you get to pick the ones you want. You don't know that term, do you? Automat? Well, <laughs> I guess that dates me. <laughs> a few of you know it. I know a few of you know it out there. If not, go watch some old Doris Day, Cary Grant movie, you know, the classics, you know. Yes, yes, they were in color. <laughs> yes, they did have sound. I'm not going back that far. You see, they used to have these cafeterias, especially in big cities that resembled giant vending machines, a whole wall, hundreds of slots with freshly cooked food, all behind little windows. You put your nickel in the slot and you pulled out your food and you went and sat at your table. Yes, many of the food items back then were only a nickel and you ate your lunch. But you know what? 
now that I'm thinking about this, in the days of COVID-19, automats might not be a bad idea. I think I just had a new business idea. Yeah, don't take this one from me. This is mine. And anyway, please don't use this feature just to add more items to your symptom list. There, long time coming, but that was my original point, I think. <laughs> no, where was I? Oh yeah, little known symptoms, that was it. I I'm gonna present these in no particular order, so no emphasis should be construed based on how they are placed in the list. Am I overthinking this? Yes, I am, so let's move on, <laughs> screw it. Number one, random muscle pain. This is one that almost all of us in moderate to severe withdrawal experienced at some time, but we really don't discuss it that often. In my opinion, there are two factors at play here. One is the damage to our nervous system that happens after long-term benzo use. Our, our nerves are the messenger highways of muscle aches and pains, as we all well know. Our central and peripheral nervous systems can be damaged during benzo use, and as they attempt to heal, they can be known to send erratic signals, not only causing involuntary muscle movements, as some of us have seen, but also sending random signals of pain back to our brains. The second one is muscle tightness. Many benzos are excellent muscle relaxants, and for those of us who had been on them for a long time, when they are removed, our muscles can lock up, and we get pulls and sprains and even tears. That chronic tightness throughout our bodies can cause pain when we try to move. The best thing I found to help me during this time was three basic approaches. One, get exercise, but with limits. Help your muscles heal by moving them. But remember, you have limitations. If you push it too far, you can injure yourself and cause even more pain. Two, do mild stretching, especially before and after exercising. Help your muscles recover from their frozen state, but do so gently. Just like exercise, you can push this too fast and too far. Take it easy and slowly. There's, there's no hurry here. And three, Remember what the cause of the pain is, benzodiazepine withdrawal, and use that knowledge to help alleviate any stress or worry when these pains happen. A perfect example is I had chronic chest pains throughout my withdrawal. My rib muscles really locked up, and when combined with acid reflux, it mimicked a heart attack. I had more EKGs than I want to talk about right now, but thankfully, they were all benign. Our muscles and nervous systems do heal, but just like everything else, it takes time. Number two, skin rashes. Skin rashes are another often overlooked physical symptom of benzo withdrawal. Strange skin sensations such as paresthesia and formication are not the only effects that benzos can have on our skin. Rashes, blotches, skin bumps, itchy skin, dry skin, flushing, slow healing of wounds, and increased skin sensitivity are also common. I, I had an assortment of these, and I know many others who have too. The good news is that they are almost always benign, but they may trigger one or two visits to the dermatologist. Most of the benzo experts, including Ashton, list skin rashes as a common symptom. And rashes can also be the result of anxiety all by itself, even without the added complications of benzo withdrawal. So this symptom should not be unexpected. The best thing to do is to take good care of your skin. Get it checked out if you are concerned, but don't let a rash or bumps on your skin keep you up at night. As with most symptoms, it will ease over time. Number three, irritability. In episode 13 of the podcast, we talked about anger, aggression, and a few other related symptoms. But one far more common symptom that often goes overlooked is plain, old-fashioned, homegrown irritability. <laughs> yes, irritability can often lead to anger, aggression, rage, and even violence. But it can also just remain irritability. 
and sit right under the surface, making your life, and especially your relationships, a bit more difficult to manage. And this is far more common than most of us realize, mostly because its effects are mild and build over time, thus making it difficult to identify the cause of the issue once it finally erupts. I still have this one, and I know many of you do too. It's insidious the way it slowly sneaks up on you, often with no warning until you realize that every tiny, apparently inconsequential thing your spouse does, your child does, or even your dog does gets under your skin. And over time, it builds. As with some other symptoms of benzo withdrawal, this one comes back to the lack of self-control on our emotions. Our, our brake line has been cut. We're pumping the brakes as fast as we can, but we're just not slowing down our reactions. It's those darn little down-regulated GABA receptors. <laughs> we just have to give them time to heal. While this chronic irritability usually doesn't lead to rage or violence, although it can in extreme cases, it still takes a toll on our emotional and physical well-being especially when it goes on for months or years. So how do you deal with it? I found a two-step plan. Two very basic, simple steps made a huge difference for me and for others I have talked to. Now, remember, I'm not a medical professional, nor am I a professional counselor. These are just some tips and tricks that I picked up along the way that I found worked for me. Number one is noticing it when it happens. Developing the habit of noticing your emotions, what triggered them, and most of all, why, goes a long, long way in helping to alleviate the situation. And then the second step that worked for me was to step away. This is always a good rule when it comes to anger. Just step away from the situation, even if just for a few minutes. It can make a world of difference, especially if you know the real cause of your anger. Just noticing when you become irritated and stopping to take a short break can help you save your relationships and perhaps even your marriage. Be aware of your irritability. Notice when it happens. And remember to apologize to those around you if you took it out on them. Number four, overwhelm or singular focus. You know, some of us find that attempting to do multiple things at once during withdrawal can be very difficult. What little ability we thought we had to multitask seems to have vanished. <laughs> and with that, we find a sense of overwhelm at everything. Our daily schedule, our career outlook, our children's future, the world's problems, even the apparently benign task of making lunch. That was me just the other day. Indulge me for just a second while I share this story, which may sound somewhat familiar to many of you. The other day while working on the script for this podcast, I took a break and was pulling leftovers out of the fridge for lunch. A, a bit of pot roast, some leftover spaghetti, good food, some of my faves. Now, before we go any further, I must tell you that I'm a foster. <laughs> and fosters love food. Not so much a foodie or gourmand. I just love food, any food. It runs in my family. And I hate to be distracted when food is on the way, especially when it means that the food will get cold before I get a chance to eat. I know, I know, first world problems. <laughs> Don't worry, this gets worse. <laughs> anyway, I put a piece of bread in the toaster to have with my meal, and I was getting ready to reheat food for me and Shanna, setting out our plates and silverware, the, the usual. Now, let me remind you, multitasking was never my expertise, and withdrawal did not help. I already had two things going, the toast and reheating the food. Just then, Shanna came into the kitchen and asked me to sign an anniversary card. I have to admit, I was a bit annoyed. <laughs> I mean, it was time to eat, and like I said, I'm a foster. But I stopped and signed it. Now, just so you realize how unfair my irritability was, 
this was a card for my parents' anniversary, not hers. And if she didn't remember to send one, I probably wouldn't have. I am not proud of this, but it is honest. And I always told you, this is me, warts and all. And this is a word. <laughs> anyway, in my head, that's three things now to keep track of. So I signed the card and we put it in the envelope. And Shanna wanted to get it to the mailbox before we ate so that the mail carrier could pick it up. Now that's four things to keep track of. So trying to be a good husband, I mean, she did create and print out the cards for my parents. So trying to reach the bar she sets for being a good spouse can be daunting, but I try as best I can. And I offered to take it to the mailbox. I go into the laundry room to put on my shows and I notice the washer and dryer. I totally forgot we were doing laundry <laughs> and the dryer had shut off and the clothes were wrinkling. Now, I usually set a timer on my phone to change the laundry since I can't hear the dryer bell from my office in the basement. But as I often do, I forgot. Anyway, that's five. <laughs> and as we just talked about in the last category, my irritability level was rising and rising fast. Okay, bear with me. I'm almost done with the story, I promise. So <laughs> I started the dryer to fluff the clothes, thinking I would empty it when I got back from the mailbox and then heat our food for lunch. And I headed for the front door when I heard a ding. I had no idea what the sound was. I walked back down the hall and looked at my wife quizzically. And she said, with more understanding, thank God, than annoyance, that it's my toast. <laughs> Oh, crap. And we all know the number one rule with toast is that toast must be buttered immediately when it gets out of the toaster. It's a fact. It's not open for debate. I'm just saying. So I quickly returned, buttered the bread and left it on the counter and headed back out for the mailbox. Well, okay, I'm going to stop there. I could go on and on with this story. I mean, even more than I already have. But suffice it to say, I had a mild meltdown. Shanna finally told me to go sit down and chill for a minute, and she was right. I couldn't handle all those things going on at once, and I was making mistakes, and I was getting irritated. I just kept getting more and more angry at my wife, at my dog, but honestly, mostly at myself. Thankfully, Shanna is my angel and puts up with me. She has been through this with me more times than I can count. She recognized what was going on and suggested I take a short break, and it worked. Yes, my toast was cold, but I was able to eat it in a much more calm state of mind. And more importantly, I was able to be a better partner to my wife after I calmed down. It's amazing what just a couple minutes of a break can do. So, all that just to say this, being overwhelmed, being only able to do one thing at a time is not uncommon in withdrawal. And it's okay. It's okay. We don't have to get upset about it. It happens. I'm getting better as my recovery continues. And I know I am healing over time. In the meantime, just as with the irritability, notice your limitations. Notice when this starts to happen and find ways to work around them. Tell the people you love around you what's going on and have them help you. Try and limit the number of things on your to-do list, especially how many you have to do at once. Work with your limitations instead of against them. They're temporary, so don't let them get you down. Number five, personality change. One of the biggest surprises to many people in withdrawal is that of personality changes. For some of us, not all, but for some of us, our personality is somewhat different after this experience. Now, first, let me say, this is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, some of us needed a change in our personality. Yes, you know who you are. And yes, I'm one of those too. I experienced changes in my personality after my withdrawal, not huge changes. I'm not about to climb Mount Everest or become a street artist on Venice Beach or raise a family of emus. 
I'm still basically the same person, but subtly, some things have changed. Why does this happen? Well, two things might be going on here. The first is that these drugs have changed our brains. It's a fact. And when our brains change, well, our personalities can change with them. It may be changes for the good or changes for the bad. It's all subjective. And even though I love philosophical discussions, this is not the time or place for them. Then again, I never let that stop me before, but I'm going to stop right now. Are these changes permanent? Probably not, but we really don't know for certain. Still, I don't think that brain changes is necessarily the biggest factor affecting what's going on here. The second thing that affects our change in personality is that we just faced a life-altering event. This is quite common for people who face a near-death experience, or NDE. For those of us who have experienced severe benzo withdrawal, we have been forced to face a serious, debilitating illness, deal with its ramifications for months, sometimes years, and decide what that means for our lives and make changes accordingly. How could you not come out the other side slightly different? So, yes, our personalities can change when we go through benzo withdrawal. I know mine did. But remember, it doesn't have to be a change for the worse. Mine, for sure, was for the better. And I know many others of whom that was also the case. I think it comes down to you and what you decide to do with this experience. Number six, social skills. Some of the changes we may experience during and after withdrawal are the loss of skills that we haven't used in a while. Skills can atrophy when we don't use them regularly. And social skills are no different. Many of us become isolated during this time and we don't communicate with others as much as we used to. Many of us also face agoraphobia and other social phobias, which even further limit our contact and our experience with socialization. The ability to socialize is a skill. Like any other, if we don't use it, we can get out of practice. But don't worry. With a little work and a little bit of patience, social skills do come back. And I speak from experience on this one. Number seven, lowering the bar or a change in perspective. One of the phrases I have found myself repeatedly repeating is, is that okay? <laughs> repeatedly repeating? <laughs> oh, well, who knows? <laughs> anyway, the phrase is that of lowering the bar, meaning that my expectations have been lowered. Now, I realize that for many people out there, lowering the bar of expectations sounds a bit sacrilege, and I get it. It's almost like I'm saying, stop chasing your dreams. And well, I guess I am, but, but not in a negative way. Are you confused? <laughs> Me too. I hope to hell I know where I'm going with this. <laughs> We're going to figure this out. I think it comes back to acceptance. We've talked about this before. We all live with expectations. They are inherent to the human condition. We want certain things in life. We want love, success, money, stability. Some of us want fame, power, and, and even more money. <laughs> but in the end, what are we really chasing? I think if you ask most people, in the end, they think it's happiness or even joy. I, I prefer that term sometimes. And the question most of us rush by on our way to buy the next lottery ticket or make the next audition or ask their boss for the next promotion is, will this make me happy? Perhaps the biggest change for me during withdrawal was what I call lowering the bar of my expectations. Instead of aggressively chasing the good life, whatever that is, Instead of striving for some goal so I can finally be happy, I realized that the good life was already all around me. My wife, my home, my dog, my family, my friends. 
and I started to value them more. And I started to pay more attention to them. And I started to focus more on internal gains and less on external gains. And I started to smile a little bit more. Acceptance doesn't mean not having dreams. I still have dreams and I still want things. I would still love to have this podcast and the new YouTube channel become successful. I would still love to travel to Europe. Well, you know, someday, maybe after all this ends. But the pressure to do these things is somewhat lifted lately. You see, I'm okay if those things never happen. My happiness is not conditional on what may come one day. Having lunch with good friends, taking my dog for a walk and seeing the snow-capped mountains in the distance, watching a movie, reading a good book. There are so many wonderful things in life around us if we just stop and take a look. I wasn't looking before, but I am now. These things don't make me happy. I've chosen to be happy about these things. And that brings me joy. I truly hope that you'll find your path to joy once this whole benzo thing is over. And that wraps up our feature. I hope reviewing these seven little known symptoms has provided some insight and a little guidance, perhaps, you know, along the way. There are many other little known symptoms that I'm sure I should have covered today. So if you feel I missed any, please let me know and I'll take another run at this in a later episode. And now before we get to our moment of peace, please bear with me for about 30 seconds for, yes, you guessed it, our disclaimer. Thanks. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice nor any other kind of personal or professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benzo Free Podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. And that brings us to our closing, our moment of peace. It's just one minute, and it's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit before you return to the chaos of the real world. Please remember that you should only do this if you are in a safe place where you can close your eyes, relax, and let the world pass by without you for a minute. Today we are going to do a healthy body meditation. It's always a good time to send healing, healthy thoughts to our bodies, especially in times like these. So for today's meditation, we are going to do a visualization. Regardless of how you are feeling right now, I want you to picture your body in perfect health. Strong, powerful, confident, and able to handle any disturbance which may come your way. There's no mantra for today's meditation, just a point of focus. And that is on the picture of your perfectly healthy body. Let's get started. Close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly. Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. 
and let it out slowly along with all the stress of the day. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly, relaxing your entire body. Now just breathe slowly and naturally. And picture your body in perfect health, sending it thoughts of strength and fitness. If your mind wanders, which it will, just gently bring it back to your body. No judgment. Continue to do this for one minute. Our next scheduled episode is episode 63, and it will be released April 15th. Thank you again for joining me today, and please, let us know how we did. We'd love to hear from you. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.